41. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus says, Jesus says, spread the tidings all around. Jesus says, Jesus says, bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus says, Jesus says, sing above the battle strife. Jesus says. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you that you love us so much that you sent your Son to die on the cross for our sins, that we may have a chance to live with you in heaven. We thank you, God, for this opportunity we have now to study your word. We pray that you will be with the teachers, pray that they may present their lessons in such a way that it will be easily understood by everyone who hears them and that they may take it what they hear and apply it to their lives and bring lost souls to you we pray god that you will be with the the sick but that you will restore them to their much wanted and needed help be with those who are traveling we pray that they may get to their destination safely we pray god that you will be with our military men and women we pray that you will keep them safe and also that you will watch over their families while they're away and that you will bring them home when their, their job is done. We pray God that you will also be with the situations that, that are going on in the world. We pray that, that uh, your will be done and we pray God that uh, there may be, it may be a peaceful resolution. We pray that you'll be with us now as we go through the rest of this service. Forgive us when we do wrong. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening. My pleasure to welcome you here to the Bremen Church of Christ. We're grateful for your attendance here at our Wednesday Bible study period. Hey, Corinne. And if you are a visitor among us this evening, we are especially glad to have you and invite you back anytime you can be here. We'll dismiss now with the nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. Middle school, high school, and adult, or middle school and high school classes dismissed.
maybe it'll settle down a little bit. It's good to see each of you in the class. Have visitors with us. We're delighted that you're here. We are involved in a series of studies on the church. And we began with <clears throat> 52 lessons. We're down to number 47. So we are getting rather close to the end of this series of studies. Hopefully it has been profitable to us. We began, and the basic background of this particular study <clears throat> is that there are a lot of religious organizations with various names, doctrines, practices, etc. And in all of that, our Lord said, Upon this rock I will build my church. The midst of all of the religious confusion that exists, we need to be able to identify the Lord's church in contrast to every other religious organization that may exist. So much of what we've studied is simply characteristics of the New Testament church. In our study tonight, we're going to look at numerical growth. That's lesson 47 in your outline book. If you don't have one, hopefully you're close to somebody that does. But um, we're concerned about growth. We're always concerned about growth. And we ought to be concerned about growth, numerical growth. We'll talk about spiritual growth in our study, Lord willing, next week. But numerical growth. Whenever we talk about numbers, what are we talking about? We're talking about souls, aren't we? And so while we are not interested in numbers just for numbers' sake, yet each number represents a soul. And that is our concern. <clears throat> Jesus came for what purpose? Luke 19 and verse 10. Seeking to save the lost. And if we are His people, if we are the body of Christ, and we're going to carry on His mission to seek and to save the lost, then the end result will be numbers. Increased numbers. We're all familiar with the Great Commission. Each of the four accounts of the Gospel has its own rendering of that Great Commission. Matthew's account says, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. What is the charge? Go. What are we to do when we go? Teach. Now in that particular verse, Matthew's account, he does not specify, in that section at least, what is to be taught. But there should be, even from Matthew's account, no doubt. But Mark's account specifies what is to be taught. Go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. So there again is the charge. Go. He tells us when we go to preach or teach. And he told, tells us what? Preach the gospel to every creature. Luke's account of that same Great Commission, Luke chapter 24, is that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, from Matthew's account, which tells us to go and teach, but didn't tell us what, to Mark's account that tells us, in a general sense, what to teach or preach, the gospel, Luke even gets more specific than that, does he not? Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Now John's record is much less involved in that. Jesus simply says, As the Father hath sent me, so send I you. And so in each of the accounts of the gospel, you have in one form or another that commission. It is referred to as the Great Commission because there is no greater work than that of the saving of the souls of lost men and women. 
And whenever we do that, numbers will be involved. I want you to look at a text in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and in verse 13. This is somewhat of a launching pad and we'll really look at the this, this statement of the verse and then some implications of that as we try to develop this study this evening. Paul says, We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore we speak. There are some things that we must believe. Obviously, according to Hebrews 11:6, the Hebrews writer said, "Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. He that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is the reward of those who diligently seek Him. Some things we must believe. We must believe that God is. We must believe that God is a rewarder, but not a rewarder of everyone, but a rewarder of whom? Those who occasionally seek Him. No. Those who diligently seek Him. Now that ought to wake a lot of brethren up to realize that God has never promised to reward indifferent, haphazard, spasmodic service in the kingdom of God. But it is for those who are diligent seekers of God and obviously involved in that is His will. But beyond that and specific to the saving of the souls of lost men and women, I believe there are some things that we must believe. And if we believe them, then will we not react based upon that belief. Those are the things that we have listed for our consideration this evening. Number one, all men out of Christ are lost. <clears throat> Why would we reach that conclusion? <clears throat> Simply because salvation is a spiritual blessing. In Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse 7, Paul the writer says, In whom, that is in Christ, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He mentions redemption. He mentions forgiveness. A little different concept, talking about the same thing. That is, being free from the guilt of sin, and as a result of that, back into a relationship with God that is certainly favorable for us. But where is that spiritual blessing, redemption, forgiveness of sins. It is in Christ. As a matter of fact, if you back up to verse 3 of that chapter, Ephesians 1, Paul simply says that all spiritual blessings are in heavenly places in Christ. With that in mind, it shouldn't be any problem then for us to accept the fact that all men outside of Christ are lost. Where is any reference in all of the Bible that indicates that those outside of Christ have any hope of salvation? There is none. And again in Ephesians chapter 5, Christ is the head of the church and He is the Savior of what? The body. The body. The Savior of the body. What's the body? The church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. So He's the Savior of the church, the body. There is no difference in being in Christ and being in the body of Christ. There's no difference in being in, the, in Christ, in the body of Christ, and being in the church that belongs to Christ. Those are all the same concepts. That's where salvation is. And so when we think about this matter of, of those outside of Christ, we need to think about that. When we see people in, in your everyday activities, your goings and coming, at work, at Walmart, grocery store, wherever it is that you go, you cross paths with a lot of people. 
What do you see? Just physical beings? Or do you see people who are lost outside of Christ? How much do we really believe that? That those outside of Christ are lost? Ecclesiastes chapter 12, a passage that we noted in the outline, the soul of man is not going to die. Now we sing a song to that effect where the soul of man never dies. That, that's a truthful concept. The body is going to return to the dust from whence it came, but the spirit unto God who gave it. And without getting into a discussion of of heaven and hell and the eternal nature of both, I think hopefully most, if not all of us, in this audience understand that the soul will never die. It will be eternally somewhere. And if an individual passes from this life outside of Christ, there is no reason for hope for that individual to be with God eternally. How much do we think about that as we associate with those around us? In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus simply said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So those outside of Christ have no promise of reward, do they? Again, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That is the name of Christ. And so when you look at those verses, do we really believe them? Do we really believe that all men outside of Christ, are lost. Now you go back to the statement in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. We believe, therefore what? We speak. We speak. So if we really believe that, that those outside of Christ are lost, what ought we to be doing? Speaking to them about Christ and the salvation that is available in Christ. If the newspaper headline read, Sure Cure for Cancer, and you believe that, and you knew somebody that had cancer, what would you do? Well, you know, I, maybe they'll see that. Maybe, maybe, they'll, maybe they'll read that same headline. Maybe they'll pick up that paper. Is that what we'd do? Maybe somebody else, maybe somebody will take the time to call them or whatever and let them know about that sure cure. Is that the way we'd respond? Absolutely not. We would either be on the phone or text or email or personally or whatever. We would see to it that they knew that there had been such a discovery, sure cure for cancer. And we probably wouldn't let the sun go down until we got that word to them. People all around us are in much worse condition than having cancer. Cancer can take us out physically, but sin will take us out spiritually. So when we think about it in that regard, do we have a sure Cure for sin? Sure we do. What is it? The gospel of Jesus Christ. So how excited are we that we believe that? How excited are we in telling everybody else about it? We believe. Therefore we speak. But again... Number two, once we, if we believe that all men out of Christ are lost, the Bible tells us clearly how to get into Christ. Would not be 
a pleasant thought to be able to study through the Bible and, and all of a sudden realize I'm outside of Christ. I'm lost. There's no hope of being with God eternally, but as I continue reading and studying, God doesn't tell me anywhere how to get into Christ where salvation is. Where would that leave us? It wouldn't leave us with any hope, would it? But God hasn't left us in that predicament. He's told us not only how to get into Christ, but He's told it to us clearly. There should be no doubt in that regard. Now, where else could we learn how to get into Christ than this book? Now, if you listen to men, you'll hear a lot of teaching on how to be saved, not necessarily how to get into Christ. Obviously, a lot of folks don't think you have to be in Christ to be saved. But there is no other source of that information. God has told us where we have to be, and He's told us how to get there. In Romans 10, and there's a rather lengthy section, I specifically mentioned verse 17 in our, in our outline, but just back up there and look at two or three verses in that regard. In verse 9, beginning, matter of fact, in the latter part of verse 8, he talks about the word of faith which we preach. Okay? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now what's the significance of the little word unto? In the direction of. Toward. So with these things we're moving toward salvation. We're moving in the right direction, if you please. The, the, the belief in Christ and the willingness to confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now don't misinterpret that verse. Calling on the name of the Lord, what does that mean? Just say, Lord, Lord? Doesn't mean that because, right, in Matthew seven twenty one, Jesus himself said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of the Father, which is in heaven. Now, if you, if you combine those two passages, what does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? Well, it simply would mean to recognize His authority and do what He says. There's no other way to call on the name of the Lord. It's not just saying, Lord, Lord, Jesus cleared that up. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And you come on down to verse 17, and He says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So before anyone can head in the direction of salvation, what must they do? They must hear the Word of God. That's what produces faith. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. That's where the process starts. Then in John chapter 8, in verses 31, 32, we're familiar, more familiar with verse 32 than we are verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If ye continue in My word, then are, my, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So notice what he says. If you do what? Continue in my word. Well, that will help us to understand what it means to call upon the name of the Lord in order to be saved. 
It means we're going to hear His Word. It means we're going to continue in His Word. There's no other way. Now back up with that in mind to verse 24, in which He says, I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. So what's involved there? A faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. What is the gospel? Huh? Well, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, for example, and, and it involves that, that plan of salvation. When Paul said, The gospel which I've preached unto you, wherein you're saved, or wherein you stand by which you're saved, if you keep in memory the things that I've preached unto you, lest you believed in vain, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, buried, raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. In that context, he describes the gospel as the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, when we preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, what are we preaching? That plan of salvation. What that means to us. What did Jesus do in His death? Shed His blood, didn't He? Made possible the forgiveness of sins through our obedience to His will. And so when we, when we talk about continuing in His Word, we talk about believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. That's all based upon our hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, which teaches us about Jesus Christ. We believe that. Then in Hebrews chapter 5, in verses 8 and 9, with regard to Christ, though He were a son, yet learned He obedience by the things which He suffered. Being made perfect, He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. Author of eternal salvation unto whom? All them that obey Him. So see, it's more than just hearing the gospel. It's more than just believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It involves our obedience to His will. We noted a while ago, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. In Colossians chapter 3, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. What does that little phrase mean? Somebody said it a while ago. By His authority. By His authority. So He authorizes that which we must do in order to be in Christ. Matthew 7, 21, we noted a moment ago. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. So how are we going to get into Christ? We're going to do the will of Christ that tells us how to get into Christ. Now Paul spells it out about as clearly as anybody in Romans chapter 1, or Romans chapter 6 rather, beginning in verse 1. He begins with a question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ. Now you notice back over there in Romans 10 a while ago, faith was unto in the direction of. Confession was unto in the direction of. But when you read about baptism, what do you read? It's not in the direction of, it is into. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And then He comes on down in the latter part of that chapter, verses 17 and 18, and he simply says, But God be thanked that, that whereas ye were the servants of sin, ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. What form? What's the form? Well, what's he just got through talking about? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. We die to sin. We bury that old man in that watery grave. That which comes forth is raised a new creature in Christ. There's the form. 
ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. There is no freedom from sin until that old man is buried and a new man is brought forth. There's the significance of baptism. And it is so unfortunate that so many people in the religious world will, will teach that baptism is not essential to salvation. If baptism is not essential to salvation, being in Christ is not essential to salvation because that's where baptism puts you. Now Galatians 3.27 is the only other verse that I know anything about. And it's almost verbatim, Romans 6, 4, telling us how to get into Christ, baptized into Christ. Now, the Bible can't be any clearer. God's Word cannot be any clearer about how to get into Christ. So do we believe that? Do we believe that all men outside of Christ are lost? Do we really believe that the Bible tells us clearly how one can get into Christ? We believe, Paul says, therefore we speak. If we don't believe all men are lost, or we don't believe that the Bible clearly tells us how to get into Christ, then we may not speak. But if we believe that people are lost, hell-bound, no hope for eternity with God, and we know how they can get where there is the hope of being with God, how can we know that without speaking, without telling them? We believe, therefore we speak. Number three, man has the ability to change. If all men outside of Christ are lost, the Bible clearly tells us how to get into Christ. Then do those who are lost have any opportunity of being saved? Sure they do. They'll get where salvation is. Now again, the religious world, unfortunately, some of the religious world would have us believe that Christ before the foundation of the world Determine those who would be saved, consequently those who will be lost. And they also believe that those who are predestined to be saved can do nothing to be lost, and those who are consequently predestined to be lost can do nothing to be saved. Now if you believe that, somebody please tell me the significance of this book. Because that's really what this book is all about to tell us how to get from lost to saved. But if I'm lost and there's nothing I can do to be saved, why I can read this, quote it, and obey it perfectly, and it would be of no benefit to me if that doctrine is true. If I'm saved, why do I care what this book says about how to live my life? If I can't be lost, nothing I can do to be lost? Then what's the significance of this book? It means nothing at all. And yet it is unfortunate that a lot of people in the world that you and I know believe that. If you're saved, there's nothing you can do to be lost. If you're lost, there's nothing you can do to be saved. So if you're outside of Christ, if you believe that, there's absolutely nothing you can do. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Thank God for that. That's not what the Bible teaches. Man has the ability to change. Now we've got some a couple of Old Testament passages there. Joshua told the people of his day, choose you this day whom you will serve. That was a choice they could make. Genesis chapter 3, Eve had the right to choose to eat or not to eat of that forbidden fruit. Acts chapter 7, 8, and 9, we read of, of Saul of Tarsus. And what better example could we have than, than Saul of Tarsus? I mean, here was a man who was literally out to destroy the Lord's church. He thought he was doing right. He said, I've lived in all good conscience before God to this present day, Acts chapter 23. He was doing his best to destroy the, the Lord's church. But in time, we find him doing everything he could to promote the cause of Christ. He made a change. 
Any man has the right and the ability to make that change. John 3.16, a passage so familiar to most everybody. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. Didn't say shall not. Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why should they not perish? Well, if they believe that Jesus gave His life and God gave His only begotten Son, they ought to be responsive to His message. That doesn't mean everybody will. You know, James says that, James chapter 2, that the devils believe and tremble. Well, if faith only saves, I guess the devils are going to be saved. That we know that's not what the Bible teaches. It's obedience to the will of God. And so man has the ability to make that change. And, and there are other passages, but how many of you would have liked to have accepted the challenge of teaching Saul of Tarsus the truth? I mean, here's a man who is known for putting to death those who believe in Christianity. In some way, you get a message, I want you to go over and teach that man the truth. I might have checked to see what some of you were doing on that occasion. Maybe you could go. It would have been a challenge, wouldn't it? But you see, we do that sometime unconsciously about people around us, don't we? We know they're outside of Christ. We know they're lost. We know that we know how they can be saved. But we decide that they wouldn't hear the gospel, wouldn't believe the gospel if we taught it to them. How do we know that? Why would we make that decision? What is our responsibility? Go back to that great commission. Go and teach the gospel to every creature. Let them decide. They have the right they have the ability to change if they learn they're lost and have a desire to be saved. Do we believe that? Do we believe it enough to speak? Then number four, God has given His church, His people, the ability and responsibility to teach those that are lost. The ability and the responsibility. The little equation there, you've heard it many, many times. Ability plus opportunity equals responsibility. When God said, Jesus said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Is that an impossible task? Absolutely not not an impossible task. Is it an impossible task for you as an individual? Well, you may not be able to go into all the world, and you personally will not be able to preach the gospel to every creature. But can you teach and preach the gospel to somebody that you know is lost? I think a lot of our problem with the concept of personal evangelism is that we have the idea that we have to take our Bibles, go into somebody's home, sit down across the table from them, open our Bibles and teach them the will of God. And we don't do that because we're fearful that they might ask us a question we can't answer. And I've touched on this before. If you are afraid that somebody's going to ask you a Bible question that you cannot answer, you're probably right. You're probably right. But do we have to answer every Bible question? No. Which ones do we need to answer? Those that relate to man's eternal salvation. What to do to be saved. How to get into Christ. How to be taken out of a lost condition put in a saved condition. We have that responsibility. We have that ability. You may be able to do nothing more 
and take a little track that has the plan of salvation in it and give it to a friend who's lost and say, I would hope that you would read this. There's nobody in here that could not do that. Well, there's nobody in here that could not say to a friend or neighbor who's lost, I wish you would go with me to worship services and listen to the gospel being preached. Well, there's nobody in here that could not in some way, shape, form, or fashion do something to reach out to people that are lost. You may not have the ability that others have, but you have some ability to do something relative to those that are lost. In Ephesians chapter 6, of course, Ephesians chapter 6 has a lot to say about the matter of putting on the whole armor of God, and we know what that armor is. Paul spells it out for us, beginning in verse 10 and going down a ways. But in verse 16, he says, And above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance, and supplication for all saints. Then listen to what he says, especially in verse uh, 19 in this regard. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now how many of us in here could not do that? What's Paul asking of the Ephesian brethren? You pray for me that I can boldly speak the Word of God. Could you do that? Could you pray that I could be that bold? That the elders could be that bold? Or that any other member of the body of Christ in this congregation be bold enough to speak the Word of God? Would you be afraid to pray that for yourself? God, help me to be bold enough to speak the Word of God. You might ought to be careful what you pray for. Because God just might grant that prayer. But that's a responsibility that we all have in that regard. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, what did Paul say? I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. The thing that we emphasize quite a bit in the lessons on fellowship is that we are not in this battle alone. We have help. Go back to the Great Commission again, Matthew's account. Jesus said in verse 18, All authority, power, hath been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, what? I am with you always, even to the end of the world. When we go out to teach the gospel of Christ, who's with us? Jesus said, lo, I'm with you always. Oh, he's not there in person that we can see and touch and you know, feel his presence there. But he said, I'll be with you. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, let your conversation, manner of life, be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what men shall do unto me. Oh, I know that sometimes we, you know, we think about doing what we call personal work. We think about going out and 
and trying to teach people the gospel of Christ. But when we start thinking about it, what's our reaction? Well, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid of something else. Well, you know, we're afraid we might get dog bit. We're afraid we might get a question to ask us that, that we can't answer. You know, we, we get fearful, and, and, and then sometimes we just get downright nervous, and we don't know why. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse 7, Paul simply says, For God, now get this, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Now, if God doesn't give us the spirit of fear, who does? The devil. If the devil can implant fear in your mind from going out and teaching lost souls about Christ, what more could he ask? What more could he ask? He's caused you to be lost because God has told you to do it. And he's caused others to be lost because you're not going to take the gospel to them. See how successful he's been? If he can just create within you enough fear to keep you in your house or whatever. You know, there's a thing that, there's a thing that surfaced a few years ago. I, I guess it's been around all time, but we just finally labeled it. My comfort zone. My comfort zone. What does that mean? Things that I am comfortable doing, I'm willing to do. That's my comfort zone. But you get me out of my comfort zone, I get a little nervous. I get a little fearful. But we've got to be willing to get out of that comfort zone. If that comfort zone keeps us from teaching the lost the gospel of Christ, we need to get out of that comfort zone. So when you look at this concept, I believe, therefore I speak. If I believe that all men outside of Christ are lost, if I believe that the Bible clearly tells us how to get into Christ, and I believe that man has the ability to change, and that God has given me the responsibility to tell them about that, why won't we speak? Why will we not speak? Now, you go back up the top. What's our study? Numerical growth. When we get out of that comfort zone and we start talking to people about their souls and we start telling them about Christ and what Christ can do for them, the plan of salvation, how to be saved, how to have the hope of, of being with God eternally, and we teach them that, and we convince them of that, and they respond to that, what's happened? Numerical growth. We could take you through a study. Time's not going to permit. Acts chapter 2, how many people? Oh, about 3,000. Believed and obeyed. Became members of the church. And you read through Acts 4, Acts 6, all the way down to Acts 16. There, there are verses all through the book of Acts where the gospel was preached, souls believed and were baptized, and the numbers increased. So if we want to see the numbers, if we want to see numerical growth right here at Bremen, what's it going to take? For you and me to get out of our comfort zone and start teaching the gospel of Christ to those that we know are outside of Christ and lost. That's what happened in the early church. There wasn't some magic formula for the, for the growth back then. There's no magic formula now. But when God's people accept the responsibility that God has given them to teach the lost numerical growth, will take place. I guess we better quit.
You're asked to continue to remember uh, Vadira Marlowe, which is uh, Lola Head's sister. She has a heart procedure tomorrow at Emory. Also, I just learned that my cousin Leah Swales had emergency neck surgery today. She's at Tanner, but uh, hopefully she'll get to come home tomorrow. We're also very pleased to announce that the Lloyd family, Alan, Carol, Scott, and Lauren, have placed membership with us here at Bremen. So y'all wave to everybody. There they are. Y'all know them. But uh, welcome them officially to the family here at Bremen. Glad to have you. This coming Saturday is the chili cook-off. At, beginning at 5 o'clock, bring your best pot of chili and the dirt, desserts and fixings and drinks and so forth. There's also a teacher's meeting this coming Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock. Teacher's meeting this coming Sunday at 5 o'clock. Let us see. In Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, section with which you're probably familiar the prophet of old said that the Lord's hand is not short and that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. What a terrible thought that is, being separated from God. When Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus, he talked about those who are without God, without Christ, without hope in the world. We're going to sing a song in just a moment, Bring Christ Your Broken Life, So Marred by Sin. He will create anew, make whole again. You may recall in Psalm 51, David's psalm of repentance, he pleaded for God, Create in me, O God, a clean heart. You see, that's where it all begins, is in the heart. That's why the proverb writer would say, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Or he further stated, As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's where it all begins, in the heart. And so that life that is broken because of sin, so marred by sin, God can make it new. God can make it clean. God can make it whole again through your obedience to His will. He will create anew, make whole again. Then He talks about those empty, wasted years. One living in sin is wasting away. There's no hope for a future with God. There's no hope of an eternity that life is just wasting away from God. But you can be clean. You can be whole. You can, you can do as Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, redeeming the time. You're wasting time now living in sin. Redeem the time. And then in the latter phrase of that particular song, he talks about the blessing that comes to those who will bring Christ that broken life. That's what he's promised. We can't, we can't patch it up. We can't fix it up outside of Christ. We can't make things whole and new without God's help. Tonight you have an opportunity, another opportunity, if you're outside of Christ, to be baptized into Christ. Galatians 3, 26, 7, Romans 6, 3, and 4. Based upon your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, would you not turn away from that life of sin? Confess that faith, Romans 10, 9, and 10. Be buried with your Lord in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6. Or as a child of God, you've allowed sin back into your life. 
You know, Peter talked about those who had escaped the pollutions of the world and then are entangled there and overcome again. So it can happen. If your life has been overcome with sin as a child of God, and you're willing to repent of that sin, ask God's forgiveness. John said if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us. Tonight, if you're outside of Christ, or you've, you have a life that's marred by sin as a child of God, and you need to come back home, think about the words of this song, the significance of them to you and your life as we stand together and sing it. Thank Thee, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity to gather in Thy name and once again in the middle of a week study Thy Word. We thank You for Your Word, the Bible. We pray that the things that we've learned, Your truths, that we will apply them to our lives and, and daily walk closer to Thee. Help us to do that which is good. Help us to do that which is right and good. And help us to to want to watch over and care for us now as we go our separate ways forgive us of our sins help us meet the coming days and help us be a better people we pray these things in Christ's name
Amen.